Blender comes with two ways to render your final image. You've got EV, which is your fast game engine style approach to rendering. And then you've got Cycles, which is slower, but is true ray tracing. So it usually results in a more realistic result. But with some finessing, if you know what you're doing, you can drastically crush those cycles render times down to something much more palatable for the average machine. So in this video, I'm gonna show you precisely that, how to render with Eevee, how to render with cycles, and then what trade-offs to be aware of when you start tweaking those settings. But speaking of realistic, if you want better renders, you need better assets. With Polygon's models, textures, and HDRs, you can create architecture and environmental scenes that look amazing from every angle. Sign up today at polygon.com or by clicking the link in the description. All right, so I'm actually gonna start with Cycles because I think that is the engine that most of you are gonna wanna end up using because we will crush the render times down. I'm convinced you will be happy enough with it that you'll wanna use it. Um, and let's uh, let's turn off noise threshold and denoise because I think that can kind of complicate uh, the final result. And I'm also, just so that I can see it, I'm just gonna turn off my compositor and I'm just using a really low sample count of 100 samples, just so that I can demonstrate what is going on with, with cycles. So I went over this a little bit at the start, but just explaining it again. The way path traces like cycles work is it starts noisy and then the longer you let it render for, uh, the more refined and clearer that noise uh, becomes. And that noise is determined by your samples. So the lower your samples, the more noise. So it basically, it starts at one, right? A, a one sample image would be basically unusable, right? It's so, so noisy. And then the more samples that you throw at it, then, you know, the more, the, the less noisy it becomes, you know, you do a hundred samples, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the sample count is very important and it is, you know, it's the biggest determining factor on how usable an image becomes. Because although there is this magical, I mean, that really is the closest word to describe what a denoiser is doing. Um, although there is a denoiser, um, and let's switch slots here so that I can compare the two. Uh, it's still, it has to base it off of what it gets from the renderer, okay? So it's basically, it's going, uh, this is, by the way, I'm swapping between slots just by, you can type the number in the top of uh, the top row and you can switch slots there or by hitting J to swap between them. Um, but anyway, so it has to base it off of this and then it's doing a denoise operation. And because of that, because it had to do it on this very noisy looking image, um, you can see that I've got splotchiness appearing in my, my shadows here, which might not be that much of an issue for a still image, but we're doing an animation and it doesn't have temporal temporal stability, I believe it's called, where it'll try to base it on an animation like over a number of frames. It'll just do it per frame. So you would get a lot of flickering in this splotchiness and it would be sort of unusable. So really the amount of samples that like the, the original raw image without denoising is the one that, that matters most before it does that denoiser. So I recommend turning the denoiser off and then once you're happy with the sample count, then using your denoiser on top of it. By the way, speaking of denoiser, I mentioned it this, like, I think in the first video maybe of this series, second video, I was talking about the denoiser and I was like, huh, oh, that's weird. I don't know why it's using the open image denoiser for the, the final render. I, I later learned that optics is the one that is best for your viewport because it is fast, but it is less accurate. It doesn't create as good of a denoise operation. So you wanna use optics for your, your viewport, but then for your final render, you wanna use the Intel one because it will do a much, much better, um, it uses way better algorithm to actually like figure out, um, yeah, to, to smooth it out essentially. So anyways, but as I said, I wanna turn it off so that I can just focus on the samples. Okay, so the aim of the game is really to try to get as least the least amount of noise possible in the least amount of time. That is the game every 3D artist is essentially playing. So there's all sorts of settings and things you can tweak, um, but obviously the biggest one is you know your, your your sample count. I would say like okay if you without noise threshold we'll talk about that. Uh, but with just 200 samples, the difference between 100 samples and 200 samples is going to be a big difference, right? And it's not actually going to add that much to the render time because I think it's got three seconds of build time to actually create, you know, compile all the objects, put it on the graphics card memory and render it. Um, so it's only adding one second and it's clearing up the image substantially. So that would be a good investment in your render time, right? To increase your samples. But still, this is not 
this is not an acceptable amount of noise for your engine. And, you know, before it does the denoise, you, you'll get better at predicting what that level is, but just take my word for it for now, this is not an acceptable amount of noise. So, um, previous to maybe 2.93 was when we got this noise threshold release. And then with the release of uh, version three, we've now got time limit. So now this is actually complicated. Oh, it's, it's, it's made it a little bit more advanced. Um, essentially with noise threshold um, and time limit as well, these three values, this one, this one, and this one, it will stop the render when one of these is reached. Okay, so sometimes, like for example, uh, the noise threshold by default is like set to 0 0.01, okay? But if I was to just hit, give another render of this, okay? So from uh, 200 samples, 200 samples again, but with a different noise threshold, the difference between them is nothing, okay? Okay, across the entire image, I've got the exact same result, even though now I'm using a noise threshold. So the reason for that is that this noise threshold is actually a really low... Uh, it's it's a low amount, but actually it's the lower the value, the the clearer the noise it will it's looking for essentially your, your threshold. So that's a, that's kind of a high threshold. Um, so basically, the sample count is so low that it's rendering all of the samples, two hundred samples, and then it has to stop. So it's stopping the image before that noise threshold is reached. So whether that's enabled or not makes no difference because my sample count is so low. On the flip side, if I was to use a high sample count and then use a high or a, a low noise threshold, but again, it's a higher threshold. Kind of hard to think about the thresholds like that, but anyways. Okay, let's do this. Okay, let's set this. Do, 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 do. So I've set my noise threshold to 0.1, but my max samples is now at a much higher max sample amount. And then let's go to slot number two. Let's go slot number four now. And let's type in, what was I doing? Just trying to think, noise threshold. Yeah, now let's like double this. Okay, so times two. Will this make a difference? It shouldn't because it will not have, it hasn't reached the max sample. So it's basing the stop value and it's stopping the render on the, uh, the noise threshold, not the max samples. Okay, so the difference between them, I mean, there is a difference, but I think it's just because it has to, it has to kick in a noise threshold and it like, I don't know, there is some weird calculation that goes on when you're using a noise threshold. So you lose a little bit regardless. But you can see the image hasn't changed. I'm swapping between those two with uh, doubling my max sample amount and it's not making any difference to my render engine. Sorry if this is like going to in like explaining it, maybe you get it, but it is a very important point to think about because when you start working on a scene, you're like, yeah, which one is it actually using? Is it, ba is it stopping the image from the noise threshold or is it stopping the image from the max samples? And it kind of depends because the, the noise threshold, you'll really see it work in like a scene with like lots going on, like lots of complex objects. You've got like a tree, you've got a house, you've got a river, different shaders, you've got a shadowy part, you've got different things. It then has to render longer in certain areas to clear up that noise and then less time in other areas. So the noise threshold really kicks in. This is a much more uniform object, but there is still differences because the subsurface scattering in the icing is a very costly calculation, but it is, uh, it's quite easy on this hard candy here. Um, so it should need to spend longer rendering this area than it does this area here. So it's actually a good thing that it's stopping at the noise threshold here, or that we're using the noise threshold because it should stop rendering this area here before it stops rendering, uh, so, but it'll render longer in this area. So. Anyways, hope this is starting to make sense. But I think the best thing you could do is to actually use a high sample count, but then base your, like what what uh, noise threshold do I use? Look at the noisiest part of your image and then basically reduce this until you're happy with, uh, until it is at a noise level that you are happy with. Okay, so let's go, uh, this is half that amount. So it's now, it should be, twice as noise free. I guess that's the wording you would use for that. And you can see it's taking a lot longer to render, but it should be finished a lot sooner as well. Okay, so that's 20 something seconds. Wow, it's, it's almost coming up to 30 seconds. Wow, because it's almost hitting the sample count. I think it might actually stop at the samples. There you go. Okay, but he, here's an example, right, of the noise threshold. 
you can see big differences here in the noise. But here on my hard candy, there's not actually a lot of difference. And in fact, I think if I look over here, yep, on this side of the donut, there's almost no difference between the two because it actually hit the noise threshold before it hit the samples. So that's the difference there. So we're talking about, you know, fixing this. If, you know, if I was to render this, I would really probably need about 30 seconds of frame for rendering on, this is on dual Titan RTXs. And I know most of you watching don't have hardware like that. Um, that's quite a long render time. Now, why is cycle so slow? Well, this is actually quite a complex scene. The re and what I mean by that is because of one thing, my shader here. As I said, subsurface scattering is a very uh, costly calculation. If I set this all the way to zero, watch how much faster it is to render. Here we go. Dun, 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 dun. It should now start to rocket and then we got five seconds. <laughs> we went from 30 seconds with this noisy result to a cleaner image <laughs> in five seconds. Okay, now what is the difference? Okay, you can see with subsurface scattering, yes, you get light that sort of like bleeds into the icing a little bit better. It is technically more accurate. You also see it kind of around the, not just in the shadowy areas, but also on, you know, this part of the icing as well. Um, yes, but from afar, the difference is minimal, right? So is it worth like a six or even 10 times the amount of subsurf uh, of render time required just for that tiny difference? I would honestly say no. <laughs> for most of you watching, I don't think you need subsurface scattering. So I think turn it off because I think for most of you watching, you'll be much happier with the render time and the fact that you don't have to, yeah, render for 10 times the amount of time just for that tiny little difference. So I would do that. And then I would probably still, because now, you know, I'm down to five seconds. Why not just kick it up a little more? Let's go, let's double or more than double the, the threshold and let's get it even clearer for my render. So it's not going to stop five seconds, six seconds, seven seconds, nine, 10. Maybe that's a little too far. <laughs> Maybe I went a little too extreme on that one. Uh, the difference, yeah, 12 seconds, but you know what? It, it looks all right. So that, that's probably the one that I would go with. And then I would do it, man, maybe, okay, let's go. 0 0.03, I'm gonna use this as my final amount. So max samples, 81, 92, 0 0.03 for my noise threshold, denoiser, Intel. And then also, as well as this, because um, we've got stuff in the background and I didn't mention depth of field or motion blur. So. Motion blur, first of all, that is the easiest one of all. It's just a checkbox in your render settings, checkbox. And then I think that the shutter speed by default is set to 0.5. I set mine to one because I want there to be like a nice, and I'll just show you what it looks like when you render it with, with motion blur. I want there to be a nice motion blur when it's spinning around here. By the way, motion blur got so much faster in uh, like when motion blur was first introduced for cycles. I think probably, I guess with its inception, um, it was really slow. But they like, I think there was like one release where they were like, yeah, we reduced the render times for motion blur to like 20 times or something. So it is now so much faster to use motion blur than it used to be. So that's good. All right, so that's motion blur. And then depth of field, there's no setting for depth of field here. It's actually done in your camera setting. So with your camera selected in your outliner, then go to your camera options. And then here I want to use depth of field, check that button. And then if you look at the rendered view, you would see that everything looks out of focus and it's basing it off of this distance value here. So you would basically adjust this to adjust where you want your focus to be. But actually I find the easiest way to do it is to use this eyedropper tool for focus object. And then you just select the object you want to focus on, which in this case is my donut. And there it is. Now, why, which part of the donut? Because some part of it is closer to the camera than the others. It's doing it based off of the origin point of your donut. So if for whatever reason your origin point was like way over there, your depth of field will be totally wrong. So you just have to right click, set origin, origin to geometry, and it would reset it to the center of mass. And then your depth of field um, should be correct. And I think I'm having second thoughts about this noise threshold. I think that is, uh, I think 0 0.05. I think I could get away with that. And also I'd go, yeah, let's halve it. Max, max samples. Let's, let's see how this looks because um, 
Yeah, because I demonstrated at the start, you know, that the render times, you know, if I wanted to get it down to, yeah, eight seconds, I think I think that's acceptable in terms of like glitchiness or any sort of shadow patchiness. You usually need to render a few frames to see how it's going to like flicker across it because of, as I mentioned, it's an animation. Um, but, you know, if you, re you know, for something like TikTok, you know, Twitter, the compression is so high, you're not going to see it. So depends on what, what the platform it is you're uploading to. Um, if it's for like a feature film, you want to go for that extra low amount. Um, okay, the other thing that will make a big difference is persistent data. That will is especially important over over frames because it basically it the the build time which like it has to take the the mesh the object data and then like put it on the graphics card memory and then uh, you know in order to render it it'll only have to do that once and then for all the other frames that follow it it'll just use the, the build time from before which is uh, that so that'll make a big difference. Um, what was the other thing I need to enable? Uh, yes, post-processing. I turned off compositor. The compositor will add, usually in my experience, about a second. Um, I think it just uses your CPU. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, but yeah, it'll use your CPU. And uh, obviously it depends on how much complexity you got going on in your compositor. We don't have that much. So a little bit of extra time there. And the other really big thing that I think I mentioned would make a big difference is... Um, I, I said this at the very start, but just to, to recap, use your GPU, right? I'm using dual Titan RTXs. If I was to switch to, you know, none, um, I would not get this GPU option over here. If I And then I would have to use my, my CPU. And the CPU render times are extreme. <laughs> so it obviously depends on how good your CPU is, but mine is nowhere near as good as my graphics cards. So, wow, it says, what, is it gonna be 24 hours? That can't be right. Well, it's wrong. I assume it's wrong. But yeah, it, it, it would not be fun to render this on a CPU. So if you've got the option for those, um, you know, whatever would show up here, make sure you're using that. Um, or HIP if you've got an, an AMD that, that's uh, suitable for it. Um, now, another couple of other things. I mean, I'm, I wouldn't really recommend this, but there's max bounces as well, which is the number of bounces that it's going to do you know, off objects, right? And you've got a max for like, you know, if you want to control all of these different amounts, diffuse, gloss, transmission, all of, if you want to cap it, if I set this to one, it would cap all of those at one bounce. And it will be faster, but it will also be noticeably different, right? Like if I was to, okay, this was the previous render, I guess. Was it? Denoise? Hmm, hang on. Let's do a render. Okay, well, I'll just do a render with the light paths at one. And then I'll do another one at the light paths at uh, another one. Let's see. Okay, so we got that down to eight seconds, 11 seconds, all right. And then let's change the light paths back to 12. And then I'll show you the difference. And usually it means that you'll get, it'll be darker. Uh, sorry, when you're using less light bounces, it'll be darker, especially in like crevices because there'll be less light that's bouncing, right? So. Um, and because I've got persistent data, that's the thing. With persistent data, it's deceiving um, because it's now borrowed the build time from before. So it's saving time. So that's why it's actually, it's doing more computations, but it's faster. So it's not, but you know, you could play with light bounces if you want. I wouldn't recommend it because I think it's actually fine at the defaults. Clamping, I mean, that's, I think the default is set to 10. Um, you, if The higher you set that to, the faster it'll render because it doesn't have to clear up bounces it's most noticeable in like you know a closed off room interior with like a single point lamp it'll you know that's where it's most noticeable for something like this it's not really going to be noticeable but i usually recommend turning it off because you get a better result you get more light coming into the scene um, and then reflective refractive if you turn off caustics it'll make a minor minor difference to your render times but not by much um, and was anything else? I'm just trying to think. Performance, threads, no. I mean, hey, if there's anything I've missed in terms of like speeding up render times, let me know in the comments because um, I'm sure other people would like to know. I'm also curious what hardware you guys have got and what your render times are because I think a lot of people are very like unhappy with their render times and they they want to say like is this normal is it normal for it to take 20 minutes per frame so comment below what hardware you've got if you're rendering cpu gpu what that is and then what render time you've got so that other people can see um, because i think that um a lot of people would like to know that so there we go that's uh the difference between the two what did i even enable i'm just talking while i'm doing stuff 
Now let's switch to EV because I think um, a lot of you would be curious to know, maybe your CPU, you had to render on CPU and it was gonna take 24 hours of frame. How can you render on EV? Um, so the good thing about EV is, is that it is basically, it's real time, so you get it all for free. But you generally, unlike cycles, where everything is like accurate and ready to go and you have to then like crush those render times, with EV it's fast, but you also have to turn things on in order for it to behave correctly. So I've actually set all my, cause I think we changed it at the very start, but some of you might have different settings. So I've set it all to the defaults and I'm just gonna go through and just quickly show you how to set up EV for rendering this type of scene. So the biggest one is underneath shadows in your render settings, EV shadows. We've got cube size which is a cascade is for lamps, sun lamps, which we don't have any sun lamps, so it's not important, but cube size is for all the other lamps. And that is the basically the resolu the size of your objects and kind of like a blocky volume field um, where it's going to be starting to calculate shadows from. It's most obvious, like if, okay, that's the default. If I was to set this to its maximum, do we see any difference? Oh, okay, we actually won't see any difference, I think, <laughs> because none of our lamps have shadows turned on. So let's, Actually, let's turn off the fill, let's turn off the rim, and let's just turn on shadow for my key lamp here. And now let's go back here, and let's set this to its maximum. Okay, so this is set to nothing. This is set to its maximum. Nothing, okay, what's actually going on now? Oh, okay, so does this need to be lower? What's actually going on now? I'm very confused. Okay, so something is happening. Oh, the clipping start. Okay, that was set too low. Okay, so I mean, it's really, it's the bias, like it's all just kind of like, I mean, you have to learn what bias means. I, It's kind of, it's based on like Blender's unit scale because we're working at like such a small, tiny donut. All these values are kind of wrong by default. So I have to turn them all the way down basically. This one though, I have to turn up oddly in order for it to work. Um, but now that I've done that, you can see the difference here. So this is with 512. You can see that it's, I've got light bleeding through my object here, but then when I turn up the resolution, it's able to detect more of the object and go, okay, this part should be in shadow. And I'm getting less light bleed around there. Okay, then another one, because this is my key lamp, I wanna see some shadows on my sprinkles. And you can see that I've got one side of my sprinkle in shadow, but I don't have any shadow cast onto the icing. So for that, I would turn on contact shadows. And with that, I wouldn't see any results by default because the values are again wrong. So let's turn the bias all the way down to zero or 0 0.001. Okay, and now I can see results. So contact shadow you should know is a fakery. Okay, it's not real shadow casting. It's basing it on what it can see on the screen and it's doing a fakery. So what I mean by that is as an example, look in the bottom, like on the left-hand corner of the screen now, watch what happens to this shadow of this uh, blue ball here. <laughs> if I just drag across there, you can see that it is disappearing. The shadow is disappearing. And that's because it's only able to detect it when it's on the screen, when it's off screen, even though there should be shadow there, it's not able to detect it. So that is just a limitation of that type of calculation. And by the way, that is the same in Unreal Engine. You see it a lot in animations done with Unreal Engine, the exact same thing. It's just the way it works. So contact shadow should be done basically in animations where the camera's not moving, where you, you know, it's not gonna be an issue. But for something like this, it's not a problem. Uh, distance, I guess I just have to make sure it's not set to zero. And then thickness, the other one, yeah, thickness. So you can see if I look at this, uh, this is what it was set to before. The shadow from my um, blue ball here is, uh, it's casting shadows on things behind it, which is odd. Again, it's like, how, what exactly is it calculating on? I mean, you just have to fiddle with it. I find you have to set this value to not its lowest, but somewhere around 0 0.03, it starts to look correct. 0 0.003 for, for this scale of object. Again, your scale might be different, but that is what is looking correct to me. Okay, that's the key lamp. Now let's go the rim. The rim, turn on shadow, and then set your bias all the way down to zero. And that is basically, oh, and then your clipping amount, clip start. You just wanna turn that up from zero, essentially, okay? And then my fill lamp, turn on shadow, turn the bias all the way down to zero, and then clipping start, let's turn that up. 
And there we go. Haha. -ha. Okay, so my key, my fill, and my rim all together looks a little bit like that. And we can improve it with some screen space reflections, which you'll see most noticeably on these shiny balls here. Okay, it's not true reflection, by the way. It's not really doing an accurate reflection of what's around it. It's doing an okay, passable job, but it's not anywhere near as accurate as full ray tracing, which is what you get with cycles. But it's like, it's doing a pretty good job for something that you get for free, essentially. It's, uh, it's doing a great job. Uh, the other setting you might want to use is called ambient occlusion. Ambient occlusion, if you missed it from the start, it will add in darkening in the crevices, which is what you see naturally in real life. It's what cycles will generate, you know, accurately by default, but you turn on here and you won't see anything. And it would actually confuse me when I was practicing for this tutorial. Cause I'm like, why is ambient occlusion? And it's because it's actually, it's kind of basing it off of the, oh dear, sorry about that. Slack bot, very annoying, thank you. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the strength, it's basing it off of the strength of the world lighting, and then it's doing an ambient on, on top of it. So if this is set to zero, you won't get any ambient. So basically you have to set this to something else. Like you have to have a little bit of world lighting. And then when you do that, you'll see that there's a slight difference between ambient. I mean, is there a slight difference? It's so subtle. You can kind of see it in here. On, off, on, off. I mean, can you see it? I actually don't know. <laughs> I mean, because you guys are watching it on YouTube, it's like even subtler. But yeah, there's a slight darkening going on there and that's with the factor all the way up. Oh, you can go higher. Oh, I can enter a value higher than one. I might want to do that. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's what you would do if you wanted to get nice looking results from EV. Um, there is sampling for EV but it's not the same sampling as cycles. It is just a, um, it's basically like, I'll show you the difference. All right, let's do a render with this. Okay, look at that. Wow, one second, one second and one and a half seconds. And then if I set this to this like 12 samples and I'll show you the difference between the two. Okay, it is faster. Okay, but it's, it's like it's doing less of that like calculation of the lamp to make it soft. It's doing less of that. Um, so look, I mean, w what difference does it make, right? When you've got render times down to this amount, it's really, it's splitting hairs here. I'd just go 64, who cares? Um, bloom, we don't need because we've got it. It's working in the compositor, but you could you know use that instead if you wanted to. Indirect light, that's really only used for like big scenes. Um, it's, a, it's sort of a more advanced way of generating it. Um, but yeah, there you go. So it's kind of cool, you know, with, having EV and cycles right next to each other and kind of their values are independent. Like all that stuff that we did with the, the lamp here doesn't make a difference to cycles because cycles doesn't need it. But when I switch to EV, it will just use that instead. So um, there you go. So I'll just quickly show you the comparison of the two side by side. This is with 4,096 samples, 0 0.05. And I'll show you the rendered times. It's around 11 seconds. Oh, it's going to be 13, I guess, with the compositor on top. 15 with the denoising as well. All right. So I'd probably maybe try to get that down a little further, but I think it was like, I thought it was like 10 before. But anyways, there's a big difference, right, between EV and, uh, and cycles. And it's really, it's just this part. I mean, that's the biggest part, which you could actually fake if you put a lamp in there that was pink. So there are ways to fake it. You would have to work extra hard to fake the bounce around each of the individual sprinkles though. That it would not help you with. So there are, I mean, there's just trade-offs, right? So, all right, I won't make this any more longer than it needs to be because I think that's about it. So don't actually render this though, okay? Because I don't want you to render this and put it into a video file or anything like that because that's not the way to render. And I've got a few little tips that I want to include on how to make your donut look even better. So <laughs> believe it or not, we're actually gonna do the rendering in this, this next video, the, the one that's called compiling the animation. <laughs> um, so go ahead, click here. I'll show you how to fix your donut, make it look even better than it already does. And we'll render it out and we'll create that final video file that you could then upload to your social media, etc. So click there and I will see you in the next part.